Oh, there you are. Fabulous. OK. We'll do it without the notes. Let's do it live. Um, I'm Heather McNamee. I'm bringing to you a background in training, obviously marketing. Um, but my open source story started off in Drupal in 2002. I came for the code and stayed for the community. A lot of my contributions have been non-code, organized events, and you know, helped out the newbies. And um, I work now with open strategy partners. And the partner part of it is that we work with open source focused companies to communicate and build communities. So in this talk, we're going to um, hopefully address some misconceptions about marketing. I heard someone say marketing fluff over here earlier. <laughs> we're going to try and deal with that head on. And then also um, talk about your, your goals and your message and connect the dots between what you need to do and what your contributors want to do. And I'm going to leave you with practical tips, things you can do immediately. So if you want to play along, I'm sure you're wondering how much bullshit you're going to hear. <laughs> so there is a bullshit bingo for this very purpose. And um, I probably will use marketing terms. I'm going to try and relate them back to what you're doing and avoid a lot of, a lot of this because I think we rightfully have negative experiences with marketing, especially software marketing where you have you know, false promises met with you know, features that aren't ready yet, vaporware. But certainly, I'm using this example of two of my favorite beverages. One of them here is wine. I'm using Naked Wines as a negative example to show you what it looks like when you turn on all the bells and whistles of the most manipulative marketing tactics. So here we can see they're using virality. You know, get your friends and you'll get benefits. Um, they've also got social proof. Everyone else is doing it. Uh, you know, here there's scarcity. It's like there's a lot of wine. You're telling me it's a scarce resource. Um, they're using, uh, I mean, this is gamification, and it's pathetic. I've got no friends. So, um, and then finally, urgency. I get so stressed out when I visit sites like this, and I think we, we can fall prey to these kinds of things quite easily. I did. I joined. The service wasn't great, and the wine was mediocre. So overall, it didn't match their product. The opposite experience for me is Hasbeen. Hasbeen is a great coffee company. I'm a huge fan. I will get no affiliate <laughs> referrals from this because they don't run programs like that. They don't even have pricing incentives. The, the, what you'll see when you visit their site is the story about the people behind the product. And now when I drink a cup of coffee, I'm making the world a better place because this guy is providing education for his employees and his employees' children. It's like, I'm going to save the world when I have my coffee. Um, and I've learned a lot about coffee through buying from them. And can watch videos. It's obviously a fabulous uh, video podcast they have. And I've learned like a bunch of different ways to brew coffee. I can talk to you about brewing coffee. It's really fun. Um, so we can think about these two contrasting examples. And if you want to get smart about some of these negative experiences, I'd recommend this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, so that you can you know, be aware of the manipulative tactics that are being used against you, or you can be like a marketing, you know. Uh, person and learn these behavioral psychology and uh, motivational kind of tools uh, to manipulate people to make decisions. It's, I mean, it's right that we have these, um, these preconceptions, but we, we try and focus at OSP on an alternative idea. We like to call authentic communication. This is where you use empathy to understand your users and what their needs are, and you also want to have a really clear message, and you want to build trust with your users. And overall, it's something um, we have from our background in open source communities that makes a lot of sense. You know, communication drives connection. The connection is going to build your communities, and then your communities create business value. And so I'm going to just put a little asterisk next to business value because um, I don't know necessarily what your goals are and what your motivations are for running open source. So we heard earlier some motivations for running open source might be. Um, that you're really lonely. So here's a maintainer. You know, I think what we think of maintainership is that it's a fabulous party, lots of pizza. But in fact, you know, it's, it might be that there's a lone um, contributor working on their own, toiling away. It's certainly, you know, maintainers need, need support. And what do they need? Pizza. No, they need, <laughs> they need to get paid. <laughs> and there's plenty, and unfortunately, a lot of examples of open source maintainers and contributors that aren't even funded in their day jobs to do the work that they do. This, um, this anim um, sorry, comic comes from Tidelift, incidentally, which is creating a, a platform that's, that's taking crowdfunding and 
and turning it into a subscription model. So they're being able to offer SLAs for open source software and give the companies kind of a, that reassurance that we heard from Ashling earlier. So why do you want more contributors? This is something you have to think about. Do you want more help? I mean, we actually, it was fabulous to follow um, Hendrik. Am I gonna say your name right? Oh, Dominic, sorry, Dominic. Um, he was saying, you know, he, he's giving you reasons why he wants you to contribute. Um, we heard as well, getting more eyeballs. You're gonna have better quality software right off the bat. It's gonna be more relevant. There's some questionable sort of um, things, like saying you wanna widen your network. Maybe you want to, you know, get, you know, hire people, I suppose, is one. Or customers, let's maybe think about what that looks like. Facebook was recently um, talking about how the reason they put their software out is because, first of all, being open means they're gonna write better quality, definitely. But it also reduces the onboarding time. <laughs> Why is that? Because all of their potential hires are already using Facebook applications. They can pull from the pool of contributors and pluck them out and turn them into employees. So maybe there are some questionable reasons there. Perhaps you admire folks who've taken their open source side projects and turned them, and this is a totally valid um, motivation, I think, is that you can turn it into your, your full-time job. Um, HashiCorp just raised millions of dollars in funding. This is a somewhat negative example, unfortunately. Um, this is you know, talking about using open source as a freemium model, where um, Gitbook has almost, you know, almost abandoned it seemingly, their open source version, and they've gone and to toil away on their enterprise version uh, or their paid version, and uh, it's left people really scratching their heads. So um, I was talking over the break, you know, another example is GitLab. They have an enterprise version, um, but they're reserving those enterprise features for companies who have really large teams, and their thinking is, if, it's, if that's the case, they can afford to help support the project, so. You know, it's, your, it's sort of what your message, and oh, sorry, what your, your, your goals are. So what you take away from this section is to think about your message, meaning what it makes you unique, differentiate, differentiate yourself, like uh, as we saw Dominic do really well, what makes his project that he's working on different from other things out there, it helps decision makers, and make sure it's really clear in your communications um, what kind of help you're looking for. So let's think now about our contributors. Um, first thing you think of is code contributions, of course, but there's many other kinds of contributions you probably want. Wouldn't it be great to be thrown some cash? Um, the reason people are contributing is mostly actually, it turns out they just need the fixes done. They need the work done so they do it. Um, but they also do it because it's easy and they get a feel good factor and they also get prestige. They're like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some kudos for this, so it makes them feel good. And why don't people contribute? This is what researchers have found, by the way. I didn't make all this stuff up. The links are, are here in the slides and you'll be able to check them later. Um, what people say is they have a lack of time. They're not making money from it. And um, it's hard to learn. And sometimes they're actually just active in other projects, so they don't have time to do your work full time. And sometimes they also have trouble setting up a development environment, and that's something I've just blogged about recently. There is a negative connotation about casual contributors. You may have heard the idea of drive-by contribution. You know, someone comes along, leaves a, a typo fix, and you're like, what? I don't have time to review these things. And it's true, they are only responsible, these casual contributors are only responsible for a small amount of contributions. And overwhelmingly, well, there are lots of types of contributions, but a large chunk of them is in documentation and the stuff that they come across as they're getting to know your, your software. But let's look at this in a positive light. If I'm a marketing person, I'm thinking of these people as potential leads and referrals. So these people have cared enough to find out about the project, to come along and read about it and interact. And those first interactions that they have with your project, that's the stuff that they're gonna talk about at events like this. You know, was it easy to contribute or did the, an issue languish for six months and was it completely ignored? Or do they have to, every time they have to update their, you know, their application, they have to keep their own um, modifications up to date. So um, think about contributors or users, I should say, and contributors as potential leadership even of your open source project. Uh, this is a nice model. This is a 
kind of like taking the marketing funnel and looking at it from this perspective that anyone who's a maintainer was a contributor and any contributor was once a user. So how do we foster that? We do that by um, communicating your message in these ways. Marketing to developers, uh, is anyone involved in marketing here? Anyone at all? Nobody. Okay, have you ever been told by your company to tweet something? Okay, so you're actually involved in marketing. Very good. Um, developers are allergic to aggressive marketing. They are ad blockers. Who's, a, who's using ad blockers? Yeah, well, about 60% of developers are using ad blockers. It looks like that in this group too. And you're making a beeline for stuff that's useful to you. So you're looking for something that you're going to learn with because developers are curious, they love to learn, and they love to solve problems. And so we can think of that uh, when we're talking about marketing our projects. And we're going to talk about, just briefly, I want to frame the idea that there are customer journey touch points. And so we can put our, ourselves in the shoes of someone who interacts for the first time with your project from the first contact to where they uh, download and install it and when they seek help and contribute. And again, Dominic's presentation really framed that excellently for me. Um, that's sort of where we want to take people. So the first thing they're going to come across is your README file. This is your brand landing page. I hope everyone's following along and stamping their buzzword bingo. Your brand landing page um, is a little bit different. You know, there's no flashy bells and whistles. There's a lot of crucial information. Pretty much everything I'm going to talk about from here on in is something that's in your README or linked from your README. In this case, uh, there's just some excellent examples there for inspiration. The first thing is a license. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here because um, you guys know, and I know I'm over time already, um, you guys know you need a license. If it's not licensed, it's not open source. As well, you should include, as we heard earlier, what's the project maturity level? Where is this project going? What kinds of contributions are you looking for? Is this project on its, you know, is it like on its deathbed and you don't want any contributions? Or maybe you're looking for a maintainer, as well as your community guidelines. Um, people who want to contribute need to make sure this information is totally clear. Even the smallest open source project, it doesn't take long, but it's going to help people. I would also recommend considering time-based release cycles because a predictable release will help you hang all of your communications off of that. So Ubuntu uh, is using, for example, a six-month release cycle. GitLab uses a monthly release cycle. And they shift objectives and not deadlines. And it's incredibly motivating because as soon as a contributor, um, they don't have to wait long, really, to see their stuff being used by people. It makes it really good. And um, as well, we heard Ashley talk about some of the life signs of community. And we're talking about being responsive on the issue queue. Rust is a great example because they've just automated it. So if someone writes an issue and they'll automatically get a response from someone. It's a small thing, but there are tools to make that easier. And we talked about those motivations. I mean, we all have to stroke our egos, I guess, but it's great to have recognition and it's good for the people who get recognized and it's good for other people to see what I do matters. And community. So you should be out there talking to your contributors. If you don't already know them, get to know them. Um, don't be creepy, but there is something called a CRM, Customer Relationship <laughs> Management System. You could just keep an ID, you know, kind of a, an eye on who are the people in your neighborhood. Um, I've built this or wrote this open source contribution sprint guide. So if you're running any contribution sprints and you aren't familiar with event management, I would definitely, hopefully, you'll, you'll find this useful. Um, we've heard about documentation as well. Just to say, your documentation is the map of your territory. But people also need the travel book. They need to know what, what are the important landmarks right from the start. And they're also willing to pay for training. They need a guided tour from somebody who has experience. And um, it's taken me a while to convince project managers that you do need to provide training for your software. It's not a fault of your software that people don't necessarily know how to get all the value out of it. So just as a recap, um, we talked a bit about your goals and why you're doing what you do. You want to understand your users, that's your target audience, and what are their pain points. And then, of course, how you're um, communicating your message as best as you can. So I've given you a lot of resources. Oh, geez, ah, right, I put this here <laughs> if I had any extra time and I don't. But I, I just want to uh, keep ourselves aware that a lot of the tenets of open source are based on the premise 
that were all gainfully employed, possibly in academia. Um, and GitHub's recent open source survey of their own community showed that in fact 78% or 75% of people are employed. So it's very suspect to be relying on the work of volunteers when you're not giving something back. So hopefully you are, um, you are doing so. But there are plenty of resources here if you're not sure where to, where to go. I've highlighted here a side project checklist, which is quite good. And there's contributing templates to get you started. So if you want to find me, you can at uh, Nearly There on Twitter and most uh, good social networks. And please do check out the Sprint Guide. I did it fast. <laughs> 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 <laughs>